السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We begin as always by glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by thanking him by praising him and by acknowledging that there is no being worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last and the final, the seal of the prophets who was sent as a rahmatun lil alameen as a mercy to all of mankind and we reaffirm despite the strange sensation that we have all felt that our loyalty ultimately lies with Islam, with the Muslims, with all the believers, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. So we've got a good introduction to the talk from from Brother Ismail uh, about the topic which is it was entitled Stranger Danger. Um, and I've been asked to speak about the concept of, of, of strangeness and how it's manifested practically in our lives as Muslims living in the West today. How is it manifested? What is that feeling? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Why do we feel it? And perhaps critically, how can we deal with it? How can we deal with this concept of being strange? So, I want to start with a, a personal reflection which I've shared with others in the past and I'd like to share with you because I find that it's relevant to the topic tonight. And uh, that is just a little bit because I know it's not about me tonight, it's about the topic. But I think we can draw some lessons from my personal experiences over the last two to three years. So, I was born in Sydney, like uh, perhaps a lot of you here tonight. Uh, my parents migrated here in 1988 from Pakistan. Um, and uh, they had three children at the time and my sister and I were born in, in Sydney. Yeah, so I spent... Um, 22 years, I'm 24 now, I've spent 22 years in Sydney and I spent the last two years of my life in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, in Medina, um, studying classical Arabic. My time, which was yeah, roughly two years there, was, uh, was an interesting experience in the city of the Prophet It was a blessing, of course, as we all know. However, it was also a very humbling experience and it was, a, it was a very instructive experience. Something that I could learn a lot from. The reason I mentioned this is because I, I mentioned my ethnic background as being a Pakistani, born in Australia, and I've lived abroad for a period of time. Um, it's because sometimes we're in search of a home. Sometimes we're in search of a home. And the word home, I don't want to get into dictionary definitions, it's very simple. When you go out to work, when you go out to study, and you've got, you know, when I was staying uh, many years ago in University of Sydney, which is, uh, takes about an hour to get there, and you study there from 8 to 4, right, um, something boring like titration, on your way back, you've got that feeling of going home. Be relaxed. I'll be with my family, I can see my parents, I can see some good food ready for me. The spoiled child that I was. Um, but we don't need any dictionary definitions, right? We know what home means and we know what home feels like. And so I mention these personal reflections because I, like so many others and so many of you, was in search of a home and I still am in search of a home. Because I realized at some point after um, maturity that I can't call Australia home. 
Yeah, there's a classic uh, song that um, that someone has produced, right? I don't know who, but you know, it was used for Qantas. We still call Australia home. That never resonated with me. I couldn't, I couldn't really call Australia home. Maybe when I was a bit younger, because I didn't know much about the world, but when I gained something of maturity and some reflection, ability to reflect, I, I couldn't call Australia home. It's too difficult. Just the glare that my sisters would get if we left the home from the non-Muslims. You can't call that home. You don't feel that solace. You don't feel that refuge when someone glares at you like that. Right. And I'm sure if there, if there are any reverts amongst us, or anyone watching, the, the feeling of uh, being glared at, or being under observation, you don't have to literally be glared at by someone, but being under observation, and people talking about you as if you're uh, some kind of an experiment that they have to uh, discuss the results, right? And hypothesize on how to deal with you, the Muslim problem. So, born in Australia, but I don't feel Australian. And uh, I, my family has a habit of going back to Pakistan every two to three years. And I definitely don't feel at home in Pakistan either. Absolutely so. Right? Maybe, uh, maybe someone can claim that Australia is my home and I'll think about it and then I deny it. I wouldn't even think about it in the case of Pakistan. Because it's just a funny mix of American liberalist, American liberal culture, right, mixed with some, you know, inherited some Indian culture and the label of Pakistan. Um, I lived in Saudi Arabia and it didn't take me very long to realize that's not home either. Some people might think that's a bit strange, right, because, because they would die and people do mention this, I don't know if they mean it literally, but they would really like to live in Medina, in a place like Medina. And I won't get into the details of it because that's not the topic for tonight, but it's not, it's not as it's made out to be. For anyone who's been to Umrah or anyone who's been to Hajj, they say in Saudi Arabia, the locals themselves say that there's an accepted understanding that if you come as a visitor to Saudi Arabia, you feel very comfortable. You might complain as well, but generally you, you're, you're hosted well, and you feel comfortable. But if you live in Saudi Arabia as a non-Saudi, there's clear problems, there's, there's big problems, right? And so I didn't feel that, I didn't feel the concept of home where the Rasul is buried and 300 meters from it, you've got old, elderly, Somalian, uh, migrants seeking their uh, seeking their income from the debris amongst which they live. Right? There's so so many problems, and there's problems all around the world. Saudi Arabia is no exception. Right? But that that feeling of, of that you get when you come back home, it's not manifested except on that micro level in your home itself. Right? But as soon as you step out, and to, um, to get an understanding of it. The feeling that you get when you come to the masjid, and we all know what it's about, regardless of how frequent, uh, regardless of how much we frequent the masjid, we all know what it's like. That feeling you when you come to the masjid and you feel there's something there for you, you can stay back. But when you leave the masjid, almost instantly you feel there's something out of place. But you have to leave the masjid, obviously. You have to seek an income, you have to go back home to your parents, to your family, to your wife, to your children. Now, I hope you've got an understanding or you can appreciate what I mean when I use the term home or when I use the term strange. Um, how this, this uh, feeling of strangeness is manifested practically is, again, no... Um, it's, it's nothing hidden, right? We know what it's like. If you want to practice Islam completely in Australia, you'll definitely be a stranger. You'll definitely be a stranger. Right? And I mean things like for sisters to be able to wear the hijab, for sisters to be able to wear the niqab, the jilbab,
for brothers to be able to grow their beads. Right? But it's not just it's not just the sunnah which are an issue. Even the basic fara'il, even the basic obligations, you just want to do your wudu. Imagine trying to do your wudu in the workplace. You don't need to imagine, you know what it's like. But there's that sense of awkwardness about it. Or in university. I remember once we went to Melbourne. Oh, sorry, it wasn't Melbourne, it was Canberra. And uh, we went to... There was some project regarding Parliament House there, right, many years ago. And uh, in the bathroom, we met someone. Basically, my friend and I were doing our wudu. And we, had, we were at the stage where you put your foot in the sink. And then someone comes out from the cubicle, or someone enters the bathroom. And they just stare at you thinking, what's he doing? Why does he got his foot in the why does he have his foot in, 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 the, in the sink? And he asked me, because he wasn't from Canberra, he had come down from Sydney, I think. So he asked, uh, I haven't seen this in Sydney. Is this like is a is it a Melbourne thing? Do you guys do this in Melbourne or where did you get this from, right? So, I, at the time, I should have used that as an opportunity for that one, now that I look back on it, but I just said to him, yeah, it's a Melbourne thing. This is a Melbourne thing. We put our food in the sink in Melbourne. <laughs> so, again, we all know that feeling because we all live here, and we have a workplace that we attend, and we go to certain schools or universities. Um, I'll be first to admit, I still feel like I've... I've got some, someone looking at me, even if there's no one there, when I've got my foot in the sink, trying to make more. I just feel like there's someone there looking around, is the camera's here? Is someone having a look at me? Um, we feel observed, we feel strange. But is that a bad thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Is it praiseworthy? Is it blameworthy? This feeling, this sensation that you get. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, who is a noted Islamic scholar of about eight centuries ago, he said Muslims, uh, listen to this, it's very interesting, he said Muslims are strangers amongst mankind. And true believers, the Mu'minin, they are strangers amongst the Muslims. And the scholars are strangers amongst the true believers. And the followers of the Sunnah, those that abandon all forms of innovation are likewise strangers amongst the scholars. Right? So there's this concept that, you know when you use the word strange, it's not generally used in a positive way. If something is awkward, if something is peculiar, odd, strange, if something is, you know, other, it's not, um, it's not used in a positive sense. But then Rasulullah changed that when he said, Bada al Islam gharibaan, wa sayaud gharibaan, fatuba lil ghurabaan. There's a hadith of Rasulullah in which he says, Islam began as something strange, and it will return to being something strange. So glad tidings be to the strangers. Glad tidings. Tuba. And we'll explore quickly, inshallah, what, this, what does it mean to be strange, according to the classical scholars. What does the word tuba mean? What are some of the other contexts in which it's used so we can understand? Right? Because as I said, when you use the word strange, and I gave you examples of the feeling and the sensation, it appears as if it's a negative thing. But Rasulullah flipped that on its head when he said tuba in Qurban. Right? Meaning glad tidings, happiness, welcome. Goodness be with them. It's a good thing. Now there's explanations there. There are some bad forms of strangeness and some good forms, but we'll get to that inshallah. It's not enough to suggest or to, to accept that uh, strangeness is not something you as an individual alone experience. Or that you as a Muslim body living in Australia, or the Muslims worldwide, but we need to understand as well that the Rasul himself felt that feeling. And that's why he used to retreat to the cave of Hira. 
And he used to meditate and he used to reflect. And he used to feel strange because idol worship was not something that his heart could accept even before the revelation. And likewise with Abu Bakr and those others who had in their heart something which made them feel strange in that society. And it's the same thing before them. Nuh السلام, preached his message of Islam right, for 950 years. And he was rejected and he was abused for, the, for that time period. So that wouldn't have made him feel, felt uh, welcome. Right? Same thing with Lut, السلام, Ibrahim, Yusuf. They were abused, they were rejected, they were mocked. <coughs> because they came to challenge, they came to critique, they came to, to fundamentally question. Musa السلام, he wasn't rejected just by Fir'aun, but by his people as well. And they turned back to worshipping the calf, right? And the stories go on, but the point here is that this is something which is from the beginning of time. That strange feeling. It's nothing new. One, it's nothing new. And two, the Rasul said it's a positive thing. So there's already some question marks there. How so? Why? The question that comes to mind of is it good or bad is again addressed by Imam Qayyim rahimahullah, when he says that there are three types of strangeness. One is the praiseworthy strangeness. The second is the blameworthy strangeness. And the third one which is not as relevant to this talk tonight but I mention it because he's mentioned it is the strangeness that you get from travel. A strange feeling because you're traveling to a distant land and you're unfamiliar with the landscape, the people, the processes, and you feel strange, right? So it's not particularly relevant to tonight, but I just mentioned that. But the first two, the, the, praiseworthy, blame, uh, the, the praiseworthy strangeness and the blameworthy strangeness, what are they? He says that the praiseworthy or the, or the good feeling of being strange is that when you adhere to Islam and therefore you're a stranger, this is praiseworthy. It's a good thing. This is the type of strangeness that the messengers of Allah, um, the messenger of Allah, sorry, I said that, and all the messengers before him, the prophets, may Allah be pleased with them. Um, this is the type of strangeness that, that they felt. The blameworthy type of strangeness, the one that's not a good one, is when you refuse. To bring yourself and your heart and your mind in line with Islam. And so you feel strange and you feel something in your heart of strangeness because that's not what you were made for. You weren't supposed to satisfy yourself in that way. You weren't supposed to fulfill yourself or your needs or your wants in that way. Because it's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded of you. So that's a bad type of strangeness. But the type of strangeness that we want to focus on and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam بدأ الإسلام غريبا وسيعود غريبا فطوبى للغرباء It comes in other narrations as well. Right? It's the same message but there are different endings to the hadith. Another narration is with the addition at the end it was said, O Messenger of Allah, who are the strangers? And he said it's the, it is the nuzah those people who withdraw themselves from their families and their close relatives. In a, in a third report it includes, it was said, who are they? Who are the strangers, Ya Rasulullah? And he وسلم, said, those who rectify, those who rectify themselves and others, when the people become corrupt, they are the strangers. They are the huraba. Those people who fix themselves and those around them, the society around them, when it becomes a corrupt society, they are the strangers. And finally, others have transmitted it in the words in which them says, they are those who flee from the fitah, the trials, for the sake of their religion. So you can see it's an element of sacrifice, challenging corrupt thoughts, right? 
and withdrawing oneself from, from comfort and from family. Now when Rasulullah says, very interestingly, فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاتِ Because originally, even the word غَرِيب in Arabic, it has a neutral definition when it's used in hadith transmission, but غَرِيب, the first understanding you get from it is something, it's not, it's not a positive, it's a negative connotation that's attached to it. But this word was mentioned in the Quran. Allah SWT mentions it in Surah al rahd in which he says, and I'll give you the, 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 the definition, the translation, those who believe and do righteous deeds, Tuba is for them and a pleasant destination. It's also mentioned in many ahadith, and I'll mention three or four of them, where Rasulullah says, Tuba liman shaghalahu aybahu an uyubin nas. Right? So, Blessed, or blessings, glad tidings, be for the one who is occupied with his own faults over the faults of the people. Tuba liman hudiya ilal Islam wa kana aishahu kafafan wa kunya. Happiness is due to the one who is guided to Islam and he possesses provision that suffices him for his day and his content. Tuba lahu. طوبى لمن وجد في صحيفته استغفارا كثيرا. Glad tidings for the one who finds in his scrolls, in his record, a lot of forgiveness, seeking forgiveness. Glad tidings be to him. And of course, فطوبى للغرباء. Glad tidings be for the strangers. According to Ibn Kathir Tafsir, Ibrahim al Nakhai. The great Tabi'i said that it means good is for them, khair is for them. Qatada said, when a man says Tuba for you, it means you have attained something good. And others said that Tuba means paradise. And some also said that it means a specific tree in paradise because of a hadith of Rasulullah in which he says, Verily, there is a tree in paradise under the shadow of which a rider can travel for a hundred years without being able to cover its distance completely. Right, so there's, there's no need to dwell um, for this particular setting on, on the word and its linguistic implications, right? But we get the general meaning, paradise or a tree in paradise, goodness, khair. As for strange, which is where the real explanation lies, it says in Fatawa al Lajna al Daima the meaning of this hadith, and I, I would read this word for word inshallah because it's a fatwa and I want you to pay close attention. The meaning of this hadith is that Islam began as something strange. When the Messenger of Allah وسلم, called the people to Islam, but no one responded, or very few responded here and there, at that time it was something strange. Because its people were like strangers amongst others and they were few in number and they were weak. In contrast to the great numbers and the strength of the enemies who persecuted the Muslims. Then some of them migrated to Abyssinia and some of them later migrated to Medina. And the Messenger of Allah after suffering intense persecution and in the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him people to support him and his cause and to support Islam migrated to Medina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled his hopes and he granted victory to his troops and he supported his slave. And the fatwa goes on. But it, it gives the, the understanding of the word stranger. Now I want to give it a bit, uh, not a better, but rather a a more detailed explanation from the seerah. Because we know, we know when, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ was sent and he began calling towards Islam, his call was not answered in the first instance, except by very, very few. His slave, his uh, wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, by Abu Bakr and 
a very few people from each tribe. And those people that did accept his call and they did accept Islam, they had a fear in their hearts. And they hid their Iman to begin with from the people around them. Why? Because if they revealed it, then they would be subject to extreme punishment. It's very natural for someone to hide something like that. It's a human reaction. And so they would suffer in a state of weakness. And they would have patience. And they would feel strange. And they had that strangeness because imagine... Take your mind back to Mecca, to any marketplace in Mecca, where Rasulullah or one of the companions who accepted Islam sat you down and gave you something which absolutely shocked you. Said that one of the inhabitants of this city is, is a messenger of Allah. Here is the proof. I implore you to think about this, reflect on this. And I assume they would have said, as it is narrated in the Sirah, that there will be trials with this. So you have to be strong. So you have to accept this with the fullest and the most complete of acceptance. So imagine the feeling of a Sahabi who's newly accepted Islam. And he has entered the marketplace in which the Meccans, and we know the, the habit, we know the disposition, the character of the Meccan leaders at the time. It is narrated in, uh, sorry, it is uh, written in, in one of the books that we studied in Medina, Islamic Studies book. It's part of the official curriculum there. That the majority of the people of Mecca were poor. But the leaders of the Quraysh would still eat in plates of gold and silver. Even though you had people like Bilal radiallahu an, right, or the family of Yasir radiallahu anhu. But the, the leaders of the Quraysh, and you can you automatically think of the leaders of the of the countries today, right? Especially in the East. The leaders of the Quraysh would eat in plates of gold and silver. While the majority of Ahl Makkah were poor. So imagine in this situation where you know the habit and you know the disposition of the leaders, as, in, as is the case with most leaders across all times, right? Timelessly, this is the case that they care only for their in, in, uh, they care only for their immediate economic interests, their financial interests for themselves for their own stomachs and their own houses. So imagine in this situation, where you know that if you profess belief, you'll be persecuted. Imagine the feeling in the hearts of the companions. Imagine the strangeness that they felt. Because now, it's a bit different. You've got entire masajid that you can enter, and you know everyone's a believer in there. So when you exit the masjid, yes, you feel strange. Yes, when you're at university or school or in your workplace, you feel strange. But imagine the feeling of Rasulullah when he got the revelation. And we know the narration about how he was quivering. He was shivering with the fear of what he had just witnessed. The shock. And he said to his wife, Dathiruni, Dathiruni. Right? Cover me, envelop me. And the first few companions, <coughs> MashaAllah, they had the foresight to, to, to know and to understand. And they were a selected people and a chosen people by Allah. But then nonetheless, they were human and they had this feeling of strangeness. And this ties in towards the end when we speak briefly about how to deal with it. But the seerah, I want to draw your attention specifically after the hijrah. Because Islam started to spread now. And that feeling which Rasulullah had felt, imagine he got revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that in, in, uh, entailed that he has to, all idols and all filth had to be done away with. 
But the filth remained inside the Kaaba for 13 years. So imagine the feeling inside the heart of Rasulullah of having to put up with the fact that the Kaaba, which belongs to Allah, the messenger who's sent by Allah to a people who have been selected and chosen by Allah, he has to put up with the fact that in the Kaaba there are idols for 13 years. Now this is a Rasulullah who used to put, in, it comes in the seerah that he used to lean his back against the Kaaba and he used to think about the way he can spread the message. Why is he not succeeding? Why? How can he go about? Right? He used to strategize and he used to lean on the Kaaba and inside the Kaaba there were idols. Imagine the hasan, imagine the grief inside his heart. Imagine the strangeness that he would feel himself. And this changed when? When did this strangeness change? If we read some of the narrations, and I won't, I won't get into them because they're a bit lengthy, and I want to wrap it up with lessons that we can learn and how we can deal, deal with it. But if we read the narrations of how pleased the Rasul was with the response of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, who was the leader of Ansar and Ansar, and he gave bay'ah to the Rasul that yes, I will protect you and I will protect your message, and everyone behind me will protect you. And his response was that we will not respond the way Musa, the, the way the uh, disciples, uh, the people with Musa responded. And they said that go you Musa and your Lord and you fight alone. But rather we will go with you. That's when the strange feeling began uh, to to decimate, right? To decrease. That's when the strangeness decreased. That's when the comfort began. The people began to enter Islam in their droves. In afwaj, in droves. Magnitudes, right? sorry, multitudes of people who started entering into Islam. So you don't feel so strange anymore because as some of the classical scholars are saying, as we mentioned, Qatada and Ikrama and others, they're talking about strangeness being closely associated to, to, small in, to being small in number. So how do we still feel strange today then? 1.7, close to 2 billion today, Muslims. We are one quarter of humanity. How do we still feel strange? Why do we still feel strange? And how is the Hijrah relevant to the feeling of strangeness? When did that feeling in the heart of the Rasul go away? That I have to put up with the idols still being present, the filth, the ruj, the rijs. What ruj is that? That ruj, that filth, the idols, the transgression. When did that come to an end? I always bring the attention of of those around me. Again, uh, I have no. Um, you know, we all, we all take from the scholars. Islam is given something that is taken from the scholars. And we don't uh, extrapolate these evidences and we don't extrapolate by ourselves, right? But some things from the seerah are very, very clear. That the only time that grief from the heart of the Rasul and the grief in the heart of the companions who when they migrated to Medina, yes, they felt the comfort of being accepted by the Ansar, but they never stopped reminiscing and they never lost the nostalgic feelings of being in Mecca. And they never forgot the valleys of Mecca. And Bilal radiallahu anhu would recite poetry and the other sahaba around him would tell him, please stop Bilal. It's too much. It's too much to handle. Because that concept of home, which we mentioned at the beginning, is something that is, it's natural. Everyone has an attachment to their homeland. I want to have a quick wrap up so we can learn how to deal with this feeling. And that comes with an, with an appreciation of history after 
the Rasul passed away. And after the Khulafa Rashidin left us. Because what happened is after this is that the, the shaitan unleashed his plot, his evil plot upon the Muslims and upon the Ummah. And discord fell between them. There's strife. And they were caused by two main reasons. And these two reasons, if we can eliminate them, then we can eliminate, once again, like the Rasul eliminated, the feelings of strangeness. Not in their entirety, because it's something you'll feel till the Day of Judgment, and it's something all Muslims will feel, but we can, we can live with a feeling of solace, of refuge, as if we are in a home. And the two main reasons are the shubuhat and the shahawat. It's to do with the mind and it's to do with the heart. It's to do with the mind and it's to do with the heart. It's the doubts of the mind and it's the desires of the heart. And these are not my words. <coughs> these are not my words, it's, these are the words of Ibn Rajab al hambari And I mention this because, of course, he is a classical Hanbali scholar, a student of Ibn al Qayyim in the same time period. And he mentions that when the discord fell amongst the Muslims and the doubts crept into their minds and the desires crept into their hearts, then the plan of Shaitan was established firmly because he, he conquered the minds of the Muslims and he conquered the hearts of the Muslims. Regarding the doubts, There, there are narrations which we know, infamous narrations about the Muslim Ummah being divided into 73 sects, right? And the divisions and that notion of us being divided because of doubts in the mind is clear. As for the desires, Rasulullah is reported to have said on the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr that when the treasures of the Persians and the Romans are opened for you, how will your people be? Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu said, We will say what Allah has ordered us to say. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Or other than that, and he clarified, You will compete against each other. Then you will envy one another. And then you will turn your backs on one another. And in Sahih al-Bukhari, on the authority of Amr ibn Awf radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I swear by Allah, I swear by Allah, it is not poverty that I fear for you. Rather, what I fear the most for you is the pleasures of the dunya. They will be presented to you as they were presented to those before you. And you will compete against each other for it as they competed against each other. And it will destroy you as it destroyed them. Right? And there are other ahadith which mention the concept of wahid, love of the dunya and hatred of death. But there is also mention in the, in the ahadith of a triumphant group. A triumphant group from my ummah, triumphant upon the truth. Those who oppose them will not be able to harm them. Nor will those who abandon them until Allah's order comes about and they are in that state. They are the ones who are the strangers. They are the ones who are the strangers. That, the quote that we mentioned earlier from Ibn Qayyim about Muslims feeling like strangers amongst non-Muslims, it's very clear. But the next part of it, Muslims feeling like strangers amongst Muslims because one is higher in his level of Iman. And you get that. And the hadith, it hints at that. That there is a triumphant group amongst the ummah. There is an ummah amongst the ummah. And the indication here is to cling on to the sunnah. The indication here is that the triumphant group, the lessons that we learn from a hadith about the saved sect, the one, the, the one 
sect out of the 73 that will not go to hellfire and the 72 that will or the triumphant group the thing we learn from it is not the specific group is it this group or is it that group is it this organization or is it this association or is it this uh, sheikh and his followers no what we learn from it it's an illustration of principle that sticking to the sunnah to the exclusion of everything else is what brings about that triumph is that brings about that victory and so the way forward right in light of the realization that we are strangers that the rasul felt that feeling the all the messengers felt it and on the basis of the understanding that the rasul sallam never stopped feeling that feeling of strangeness in his life even after he had a home in mecca and medina Right, but specifically, he never stopped feeling it until he was given bay'ah and until he was given support. Until he was given support, until Islam was allowed to flourish in a way where some inspector or some leader of a tribe or some chief will come and imply and enforce some kind of penalty because you followed Islam, like we witness today. There are penalties, right, with the drafting of terror legislation just for being Muslim. Just for being Muslim. The excuses will be made that it's for reasons other than that. But ultimately it's for being Muslim and subscribing yourself to Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah. To say my loyalty lies with the party of the believers to the exclusion of all other parties. That is why Muslims feel the feeling of strangeness. That is why they are ghuraba. And it's clear because it mentions this in the hadith when the Sahaba asked him, and who are the ghuraba? He said those who when the society becomes corrupted, they fix society. The people, they fix the people. When the people become corrupted, they hold their hand. Muslims and non-Muslims. Al-Tabarani reported from the hadith of Abu Hurairah عنه, that the Prophet وسلم, said the one who clings onto my sunnah at the time of corruption of my ummah will receive the reward of the martyr. And so I make a quick reference again. I have five minutes left. And I make a quick reference again to what I mentioned in the beginning. Sydney I was born in Sydney, I was born in Darlinghurst, which is right down uh, near the city. And I've lived in the West, in Western Sydney my whole life. But the words, even the name Sydney, you know what it's named after? It's named after the then British Foreign Secretary, Lord Sydney. Right? And it's not a simple point about, I don't like the guy, so I can't like the place. But it's about what it stands for, what it represents. And what for me does Pakistan represent? And what for me does a place like Saudi Arabia represent? And where is my home? I draw your attention to, again, Ibn Al-Qayyim, who writes in a book of his, Hadi, I forget the title, Hadi al arwah ila bilad al afrah, spurring souls onto realms of joy. Right? It's a book about Jannah and about the description of Jannah. And he says in it that so rush, fahiyya, rush to the gardens of Eden, for indeed it is your original home. And in it is a place of rest. However, we are in the captivity of the enemy, so don't you see? Shall we return to our homes and find peace? And it has been determined that when the stranger is far away and his home has disappeared, then he is lost. So what type of strangeness is greater than our strangeness, which the enemies amongst us have manifested? If you live in a place, 
where your Islam is observed and you're given commentary on your Islam as if it is something strange then surely you always feel like a stranger in that place so where is the home on earth because we all know ultimately as the, this talk has outlined as I hope it's outlined we all know that ultimately only Jannah is the real home where you feel no strangeness whatsoever but in this world where is the home where Islam will not be seen as something strange? Australia doesn't get the tick for me. Nor does anywhere in the Western world. Nor does anywhere in the Muslim world. So, so where, is, where is that home? Where is that, that place that there will not be uh, the strangeness, right? We will not feel like strangers. To end, I mentioned again a quick reference to the seerah, and I'll finish it off with a hadith, inshallah. And the reference to the seerah, and I want you to walk away with this. It's seerah. Right? There's nothing. It might challenge the way you think, <coughs> but it's the seerah. So if it does, it should. Right? The hazm, the, the hazm, the, the grief that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi felt because there were group, there were uh, idols in the Kaaba, which is the holiest place on earth. And he was the, the, the final, the seal of the messengers had to put up with the grief that there's idols in the Kaaba, which is the house of Allah on earth. The, the moment that he stopped feeling this strangeness was a particular part in the seerah. And if you read your seerah books, it comes when he's given support. He went around seeking support from the tribes. That the, 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 he tried with the Meccans. He tried very hard. But they persecuted him. They boycotted him. They fought him. They made him starve and tie stones to his stomach. Hatta the cries of the the babies would resonate from the valleys of Mecca. So they were no friends of his. And no messenger was ever welcomed with flowers. And the messenger himself was persecuted until his legs and his, his blessed feet bled. He was stoned. Companions were buried alive. Companions were crushed with a stone on their chests. So when did that end? When he was given support and he came back to Mecca after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah had been violated and Abu Sufyan, and I bring your attention to a very specific part of the seerah perchance you may reflect and perchance we all may reflect and learn something from it is when Abu Sufyan came back to the Meccans and he said to the Quraysh he said to the Quraysh I wish for the effect the purpose of the effect that the original words have on us, if I can remember the Arabic. He said, Ja'akum Muhammadun bi jayshin wa bi rijalin la qibala lakum bihim. Muhammad, sallam, you fought him for 13 years simply because he said, La ilaha illallah. But now, sorry to say, but he's coming to you with an army and he's coming to you with men who you simply cannot face. So give up the fight. And he entered Mecca. He destroyed the idols because he could, because he had the capacity to, because he had the men, the resources, and he could purify that which the Quraysh didn't accept to purify themselves. So their hands had to be forced. The Prophet ﷺ said, live in this world as though you are a stranger. Live in this world as though you are a stranger or a wayfarer. And I finish with that hadith, that strangeness that is felt by many Muslims. It's a good thing. It can be a praiseworthy strangeness, as mentioned by Ibn Qayyim, that confirms our love of Allah Taala and His Messenger. And it reminds us of the struggle of the Messenger of Allah, as if we're travelers. And we've just stopped on the way, waiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to call us.
to our final home in Jannah, insha'Allah. I call the Holy Hada, and I stop for Allah, and you are the one. For stop for you, for in Allah, who will offer Rahim. Why you salam to Bahi or Kat? Very um, interesting and um, interesting talk, which um, I guess clarified a lot of things for us.